Hello, welcome to the Soul of Leadership Seminar presented by Deepak Chopra and Paltalk.com. I'm Diana Felsone and thank you so much for joining us. We are here with Deepak Chopra himself. Thank you for joining us Thanks. this morning. And to everyone as well, members of the press, especially on this hot day in New York City. Deepak, why this book? You've written countless bestsellers, but what really drove you to writing about the soul? I've been teaching the Soul of Leadership course for about nine years. It started off with a keynote that I gave to the graduating class in business school and I asked them uh, what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of business do you want to create? What kind of leader do you see yourself as, if you see yourself as a leader? And the responses I got were just astounding. So based on those responses and based on the collective vision of a new generation, I thought uh, we should uh, do a course that uh, is uh, about change and transformation from the deepest core of our being, which we refer to as the soul. And when we speak of the soul, Deepak, what exactly is that? Because it's not something that's tangible, that we can touch, that we can feel, that we can taste. What is your definition? It's what makes for tangibility. You know, you, the soul is not tangible, but without it, there would be no experience of the tangible. Mm -hmm. So what cannot be seen but makes seeing possible. What you can't touch but makes uh, the experience possible. What you can't even conceive of but makes conception possible. So it's your core consciousness from where your thoughts come, from where your feelings arise, from where your inspiration, your imagination, your intuition, your creativity. Mm -hmm. These are expressions of a core consciousness. Of course, they're orchestrated through the brain, but you're not the brain, you're the user of the brain. People are watching us uh, in their uh, computers, but we're not in their computers. So too, you're not in your brain, you're just using your brain. Now you created an acronym for the Soul of Leadership book. Would you like to explain that? Yeah, there's six or uh, seven letters of the word leaders. L stands for look and listen, uh, but from the deepest core of your being. So being, feeling, thinking, these are the expressions of the soul. So listen from that level. That's the letter L. E stands for emotional freedom, emotional empowerment, emotional intelligence. A for awareness of needs and responses to those needs. I've got you know an expanded list of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the responses to those needs. Uh, D stands for doing, action orientation. The next E stands for empowerment, mm -hmm. which goes beyond your self-image to yourself. R for responsibility. And S for synchronicity, the magical component of great leaders. Good luck <laughs> being at the right place at the right time. But what about being a leader in your personal life, your family? Yeah, leader in your personal life, leader of your family, leader in business, leader political party, leader of a country, leader of the world. They're mm -hmm. all the same principles. I learned the core principles of leadership from my mother. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because you have become such an inspiration to so many people across the world. But who inspires you, Deepak? I would say at this moment, silence inspires me. When I can quieten my We're internal dialogue and listen to silence, then that inspires me. But growing up, my parents were the greatest inspiration. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, later on, there were, I had archetypal heroes, you know, from Mahatma Gandhi to Martin Luther King Jr. But I'm done with that kind of inspiration now. And now it's on to something even higher. It's still silence. Still silence. Well, we're going to not have any silence here today. And we do open up the floor for members of the press to ask questions to Deepak today um, regarding enlightenment, karma, being a leader, anything to do with the soul, spirituality. So if any of you have questions, we'd like to take those now. Silence. It's everything you've ever wanted. Can you talk a little um, about karma and how that can be translated? into our world and for in particular other religions that may not believe in karma, like Christianity. Or okay, so here's a very simple kind of understanding. Life is like a deck of cards. And the, the deck you're dealt with is karma. 
and how you play it is free will. So there's a dance in our life between what we call determinism and free will. Karma is past experience, choices also, but experience, any experience. You have a cup of coffee, that's karma. Okay, those experiences create memories. Memories create desire, desire creates karma again. So you can say karma, memory, and desire is the software of your soul. It creates the situation, circumstances, events, relationships of your life. But what you do with that is dependent on the amount of awareness you have. So in Eastern spiritual traditions, the goal of life, enlightenment, is to transcend karma, which means it becomes irrelevant. Interesting thing about karma that you once told me that I found very interesting because I think in, in our Western view, we look at karma as either good or bad. Something that can follow yeah, you. Yeah, it's neither. I know it's what is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the situation, circumstances, events in your life that uh, arise from a context of experience. So that's our soul. We actually have a question that is related to karma from one of our Pal Talk users, and he asked, "Please explain the science between karmic cleaning. Is it that anyone who goes through this process can have all past impressions cleared and positive energy dawned in their life?" That's an interesting question. Yes, the goal of, uh, of spiritual discipline is to go beyond karma, to be independent of it. And so how do you get independent of uh, your karma? One is you can pay your karmic debts. <laughs> it's a painful way uh, to get rid of karma. The other is you can transmute it in that uh, you can transform it. You can ask yourself, what's the higher purpose of this situation? and how can I find in this adversity the seed of a greater benefit. Mm -hmm. So you can you know, actually use it to your advantage. And the third is you can transcend it. So transcend means it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And that happens when we go to that deep well of silence within us. Every time we go to a deeper level, which is beyond the, the mind, to that level which we, we are calling the soul right now, you burn the seeds of karma, so it's no longer relevant. Uh, that's how you Explain. deal with karma. Uh, yes. Hi. I'm from Brain Rock Magazine, and I wanted to know if you could discuss a little bit what's going on neurologically or in the brain when you, do the, when you go to silence. This is a very uh, important question. What's the correlation between what happens in your mind and what happens in your brain? So here's the basic principle. There's no mental event that does not have a brain representation. We know this now because we can do functional magnetic resonance scans. And so I can ask you to think of a sunset and there's a representation. Or I can think, ask you to think of somebody that you love and there's a representation. So every mental event, no matter what you have, has a representation. But what about silence, where, where there is no mental event? This is very interesting. When you look at, uh, say, uh, people who've been practicing silence for a long time, as in mindfulness or meditation, monks, uh, Buddhist monks have been the subject of study, it, their whole brain becomes more active, actually. Uh, and uh, they have a phenomenon called gamma synchrony. Normal brains uh, the neurons fire at 40 hertz, uh, whereas in adept meditators, they fire at 80 hertz. So there are more conscious moments per second. They're more awake, as they say in Eastern wisdom traditions. And for them, time seems to move slower. So they see things in slow motion. I can do that too, by the way. But so do sports people experience that. You know, you ask uh, Michael Jordan, when he has his peak moments, everything is in slow motion and, and in fact his internal dialogue goes into mute as if somebody has pressed a mute button. So artists, musicians, dancers and meditators share this experience of uh, gamma synchrony or brainwave coherence where the whole brain is actually more active in silence, more coherent and we presume more intuitive more creative uh, because it's also more relaxed. Sandra in the United Kingdom has a question. Oh, okay, Cassandra. 
Diana and uh, Deepak Chopper, it's really uh, wonderful to, to hear you. Um, I, I was wondering, could you, could you talk to us about inspiration and the things that inspire us? The things like music, the things like art, the things like drama, um, you know, are there things that you find uplifting? And, and what part do these play in the creation of the whole and the creation of you as you? Just look at the word. Inspiration means to be in spirit. So all inspiration comes from your soul or your spirit. And your soul transcends, which means goes beyond, what we call a subject-object split. The subject-object split is, I'm the subject of experience, and there is the object of experience. So, you know, that's an artificial split. Nature is one. So, in, in, as far as nature is concerned, it's one wholeness. When we transcend that subject-object split, as when we say, the beauty of the mountain was breathtaking, time stood still, that's a moment of inspiration. When the dancer becomes one with the dance, that's a moment of inspiration. Inspiration is totally beyond logic. It's a moment of transcendence of what Abraham Maslow called self-actualization. Those are glimpses into yourself. People really do seek to find that silence, to have that, that meditation. A lot of us are in this chaotic world where constantly we are being overwhelmed with stimuli. How does one find that that meditation within that because that is definitely a practice that one has to do over and over again to really become one with the meditation. Here's something anybody can do. You close your eyes and watch your breath for about two or three minutes. That quietens your internal dialogue. So you just close your eyes and just observe your breath. You don't have to manipulate it. Just observe it. And if you do that for three, four minutes, then your internal dialogue will quieten down. Then you put your attention in your heart and you evoke feelings of love or compassion or joy or equanimity and you can do that through memories. You can think of someone that you love or think of an experience you know, where you felt compassionate or um, had an experience that was one of extreme joy. Uh, then you uh, move from that experience into some reflection. Who am I? What do I want? What's my purpose? Etc. And then you put your awareness in your whole body and just feel it. So I call this being, feeling, thinking and doing. Those are the only four things we do. You know, but most of the world is doing, doing, doing and there's very little thinking and if there is thinking it's all about me and mine. Uh, there's feeling but it's all drama and there's no being. So if you just re reverse that, start with being, then evoke the feelings of love, compassion, joy, equanimity, then uh, seek understanding through reflective self-inquiry, and then practice body awareness, and you're on your way. Tom from Illinois. Okay, Tom from Illinois will be our last caller, and we'll have to start wrapping up. Yeah, uh, uh, you said something about your life being shorter, something about your life can't spend hours more. Something yeah. about life being short, and he wanted you to expand on that. Life is short. As the Buddha said, this lifetime of us is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. If you recognize that, if you are aware of your mortality and the short time that you have, then life is very magical. I think if you want to make your life magical, just look behind you and see the prince of death and he's talking you. And if you look again, he's a little closer. Okay? <laughs> We're all on death row. The only uncertainty is the method of execution and the length of reprieve. And that is what makes life magical because then you know what your priorities are. Thank you for joining us today. This has been the Soul of Leadership Seminar presented by Deepak Chopra and Paltalk.com. I'm Diana Falzone. Deepak, as always, thank, thank you. you so much thank for being you. here. We'll see you guys fun. soon.